This is the day that the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it. it. Welcome to worship at Christ Church. Today, we're celebrating Youth Sunday. You may be wondering how we're going to do that, but we're going to have youth who have filmed all kinds of uh, scripture readings and other parts of the service in their homes and have sent that to us. And you'll get a chance to see uh, their faces and to be led in worship by them. Our assigned text for the day takes us to this story that happens on the eve of Easter Day. And all of the disciples are locked behind closed doors out of fear. Does that maybe sound familiar? Sound something about like, where we are right now? But one of them is missing. It's Thomas. But as we hear the text and work through the story this day, I want you to pay attention to the links that Jesus goes to to find Thomas and to assure him meet him where he is so that he might be able to believe. A couple of things I want to be uh, lifting up for you. I uh, want to make sure if you're participating or helping us in any of the work of serving the lunches through the Grab and Go Lunch Program, that uh, that has been changed, that we're serving from Monday to Thursday, and on Thursdays we're giving out uh, lunch for Thursday and Friday. So just uh, take note of that for those who are serving with us on that. Also, uh, if you're participating in uh, sewing some of those masks, uh, give thanks, and you can find that template in the Tuesday e-blast that comes out and encourage that ongoing work. As it relates to your generosity, I continue to say a word of thanks. had a conversation uh, this week with our finance leadership team and then the finance committee. can share with you that we are doing okay as it relates to our giving. Uh, we've got what we need in terms of working capital to meet our bills. That said, uh, we're not seeing what we usually see in terms of giving, and that's uh, probably to be expected. But I do want to encourage you to give as you are able, recognizing certainly that uh, for some, these are difficult financial times, and if you do need assistance, please let us know. But for those who are able, we've had a few people who've paid off their pledge for the year. Uh, we've had some others who've paid a couple of months ahead, and that has really helped us out uh, during this time. And if you can do that, we welcome that and say a word of thanks. One of the other things that the finance team asked me to share with you is that uh, the mail delivery here at the church is uh, slowing down. We're really only seeing that about uh, two times a week. And so, again, the, the fastest way for you to be sure that the church receives your gift of generosity is to either go online uh, or to text, and you can find instructions for that on our website and in uh, the e-blast uh, email that comes out. So uh, thank you again for uh, your generosity. I invite you to remain connected and to let us know if you need anything, whether that's a spiritual, emotional, a physical need. Let us know, and uh, we've got people who've agreed to be able to help, and we want to, to reach out and meet you where you are. And last, uh, you may have seen this in some of the other communication from us, but uh, as a community of faith, we want to be sure that you know about uh, the death of Gordy Jones. Uh, Gordy died after a battle with cancer, and he died on Easter morning. And then want to be sure that you also had received word about Robert Crook, who died uh, the previous week. So we remember Nancy and her family. We also remember Judy and uh, lift up the power of resurrection. Well, we've gathered together. We proclaim that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us move forward in our worship. Come into God's presence with joy. In God we have an inheritance that is imperishable. Come into God's presence with hope. In Christ we have inheritance that cannot be defiled. Come into God's presence with longing. In the Spirit we have an inheritance that never fades. Come into God's presence with love. In God we have an inheritance that brings new life.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who seek to have peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another using our prayer of confession. Merciful God, you come offering peace, but we hold tightly to turmoil. You come offering faith, but we grasp at doubt. You come offering a future filled with promise, but we clutch the past with tightened fist. We want to believe you. You offer an inheritance that is imperishable, unfulfilled, and unfading. We want to see ourselves as you would see us. We want to live as you would have us live. We want to believe that life is stronger than death. Help us, help our unbelief, O oh God. We would live and move through life as this world is resurrection people. Amen. And now, as we confess together, we now confess individually in our hearts. And now, friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. So we prepare to receive our offering this morning. Um, we wanted to share um, with you all that even though we are apart and we're not in this physical space together um, this day, that the work of the church is continuing. Um, we mentioned it last Sunday, uh, but we have cut um, checks to all of our community partners that we have been in ministry with, uh, with Table and Cora and Chatham Literacy um, and all the other groups that we have made financial commitments to this year um, on the missions front. And we celebrate that, that in this time of crisis and this time of uncertainty that we've still been able to um, partner with these people who desperately need this help now more than ever. And that um, is because of your generous giving. Um, so kudos to you. Give yourselves a pat on the back. It was wonderful. Um, we also wanted to share, uh, in addition to sort of the monetary um, gifts of the church, uh, we're still uh, functioning in ministry together. We're still um, having small group meetings, still praying together every Wednesday morning, uh, getting to chat with our congregation in some ways that we've never been able to do um, with our pastoral hangouts. Um, our youth are still being formed. Um, there are opportunities um, abounding still for ministry, even in this time of separation. Um, so we ask you to give generously this day that the work of Christ Church can continue and will continue um, so we can spread God's love and grace throughout our community.
the God and the Father of Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into inheritance. That is imperishable, undefilled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith, salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Even in this you rejoice, even if now for a little while. You have had to suffer various trials, so that the genius of faith being more precious than gold that is perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor in jesus christ is revealed also you may have not seen him you love him and even though you do not see him now you believe in him and rejoice in his incredible and glorious joy for you are receiving the outcome of faith in the salvation of your souls. When it was evening on that day, the first of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name.
The last time I missed something really important because I was sick was my high school states for swimming. I've been a swimmer for almost my entire life. I have done year-round swimming and I've coached summer leagues, so swimming has been a big part of my life since I was like four or younger. Uh, this year for high school states, I was unable to go because in January I got the flu. I was out of school for about a week. So I was really upset that I wasn't able to go to my last high school states and I wasn't able to support my team. Um, it was difficult for sure, but I know that I had other things I needed to be worrying about. So as we're thinking about this story of Thomas, who's often dubbed Doubting Thomas, but who also, um, when you read the story, you see that he missed out on the same experience the rest of the disciples had where Jesus appeared to the, the disciples and it says that he showed them his hands and his side and then Thomas comes in later and get then gets a bad rap and because he asks to see Jesus' hands and Jesus' side. Um, it makes me wonder when is a time when you have missed out on something because you were absent or sick or um, maybe just because you didn't take someone up on an opportunity and then missed out. So this is tremendously dorky, but um, when you're in marching band in high school, you have to do summer band and it's usually like a couple weeks before school starts. And um, my church youth group was taking a trip. They, they did this mystery tour at the end of summer um, where it was like you would, you were in cars with youth leaders and you were gathering clues and those clues would take you somewhere like Schlitterbahn, which is a big water park in Texas or something kind of fun like that. Um, but I couldn't go because I had to be at summer band because that was required <laughs> for my grade. And I did not hear the end of it all year long. Someone made a dumb joke. I was like, what is that about? Everyone's laughing They're like, oh, you weren't, you weren't on mystery tour. So you, you just don't get it. You know, it was just, it was awful. Um, and so we, the ones of us who still keep in touch with each other, we mock each other about it now. It's like, well, you don't get it. You weren't on mystery tour. But yeah, it was, I mean, I just remember kind of always feeling like, like a piece of myself was weirdly incomplete because I had not been on that experience. I was all anybody was talking about, but, um, but yeah, and I had to, had to be at marching band in a hundred degree heat in Texas summer. So Yeah, the first experience that uh, pops into my mind is I had a buddy, uh, very kind and very generous, that uh, would call up pretty regularly and invite me to go to Carolina Hurricanes hockey games, uh, really all the way back to like 2005. And uh, so we've been, we went to a lot of games and then obviously the, had, the Carolina Hurricanes had that magical season uh, in 2006 when they won the Stanley Cup, and uh, he was kind enough to invite me to go to the opening game, uh, or the first game that was played uh, in Raleigh of that, the finals, and it was awesome. I mean, I, I'd never been to any sporting event at that level, and I remember just, like, pinching myself to be there for that. Well, fast forward to game seven, and uh, it was earlier that afternoon, and I was uh, running an errand, and the same buddy called me up, and he said, I know it's super last minute, but I've got a ticket to game seven, of the Stanley Cup Finals, so the Carolina Hurricanes are playing it, can you go? And I was like, whoa! I have a cousin uh, in, in, who lives in Durham who's uh, differently able, and uh, we had made plans to celebrate his birthday that night. I had another buddy who was working for the Durham Bulls, and he was gonna get my cousin's name up on the big board and the lights, and uh, do the whole birthday thing that they do with the Durham Bulls, and so, but, I mean, I certainly wanted to go celebrate with my cousin, and so we went on and, and did that. And then while we were at the Durham Bulls game, watching the baseball game, hot, sweaty, whatever, they're putting up the, the score of the game and highlights on the video board, and you're like, no! And, of course, Carolina wins. The Carolina Hurricanes win, and the place goes wild. And Well, I still go to games occasionally with this buddy, and uh, he constantly points to the banner and reminds me I wasn't there. <laughs> and anytime, you know, they cut on the sports channel, the... Do you remember when I'll, I, I have to go? Oh boy, I remember. I was not there. Um, so I didn't get to see Game 7 uh, in person, but there you have it. Yeah, when I was in high school, I started going to a different church, and so I was getting more and more involved at this church and um, had started in 
high school choir but hadn't really made the jump to also go to youth group and so usually during that time I, almost everyone who's in choir also went to youth group so I was kind of the anomaly that would leave after choir and not stay for dinner and the rest of everything and so um, one of my friends who was also in choir with me he's a year older than me we were in orchestra together at school and it, we had orchestra six period every day and so six period one Friday he said hey we're doing our fall retreat this weekend are you coming and I said oh no like no one I didn't really know about it you know I don't really go to youth group so no um, and I was kind of thinking you know he said like it's not too late you can still just show up at church at this time you can still come it'll be great and said no you know I, I just don't want to like I don't really know that many people at youth group yet and so I said no and I said home um, and then on that retreat they all had this huge shared experience that then became a huge inside joke and um, turned into t-shirts after that were um, <laughs> like some of them said I saw it some of them said I missed it and like we, there's a tradition in my high school youth group where um, the blocks in the Sunday school rooms in the youth room there's cinder blocks and so what we did at the high school that everyone went to for the most part and at church is when you were a senior you got a block and you signed your block and so that trip jokes from that one retreat were on a bunch of people's senior blocks and everything and so all the time I'm just reminded that oh no you didn't go on that retreat you missed it um, and yeah it was again one of those things just in youth group that everyone made jokes about I said well that's great for you but I wasn't there so Thank you again. <laughs> I wasn't there. We I can hear Thomas there. saying that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. When I doubted something was during my swim practice when I was doubting my stroke, and then I asked my coach, and he said it was right, so I got re- So we talked about Thomas just wanting the same experience and maybe even um, really doubting that it was actually Jesus. Like, what if his friends were just trying to pull one on him? Or something and so that kind of makes me wonder when was the time you doubted something and then were reassured yeah I mean I think there have been a lot of times like when it comes to really big decisions to make um, sort of mitigating my own internal dialogue with the external dialogue with you know sort of the idea of what is the right decision to make and trying to like weigh out all three of those um things and I, I don't know that there's one in specific that i can kind of name but it's always that that struggle of you know and i think thomas goes through this too right like he has the internal dialogue of i don't know i don't know if this is an actual experience that you all had i mean we're all tired it's been a crazy weekend you know um with what the disciples are saying and also what he knows to be true about life right that people just don't come back from the dead um and you know i think always once i get to the other side of those decisions some of them have been a horrible decisions i made but some of them have been really good and there's always even on either side there's some sort of assurance of okay that was that was not good or oh actually no this was actually a really good choice um so that's the biggest thing that i can kind of name that comes to mind I sort of feel in some ways like uh, the the test where it says always go with your sort of first instinct. And so the first thing that uh, came to mind um, is uh, I think back to uh, when my now wife Ann and I were first dating. Uh, when we kind of went through the sort of initial fun stage and, uh, you know, obviously there was a connection and sort of move along. And, and then you kind of get to that, what we like to call the DTR, the defining the relationships kind of point. Um, and I remember just sort of uh, being so overwhelmed that I mean, not just physical beauty but just who she was as a person and all that she brings to the table and this little voice like just sort of popped in my head like you don't you're not worthy of that you don't deserve mm -hmm. that like what you know, what's a guy like you doing with a, a beautiful young woman like this and so those and, and I mean almost to the detriment of being like where I mean almost sort of was like out loud like, you there's no way that you you really love me and or want to like I think you're reading the situation wrong, and I think we do that. The voice sort of gets in our head, and we doubt ourselves, and we doubt who we are, and we doubt how God has sort of wired us and gifted us. And, you know, I think we've been taught so much about humility and, and sort of so much against arrogance, and so you don't want to come across any of those. But I do think sometimes almost there's a sort of, we overdo that to the sense that we have a lot of self, self-doubt. Um, and I remember she said a phrase, something to, to the effect of, I wish you believed in yourself in the way that I believe in you, or I wish you could see 
what I see in you and that sort of sense of reassurance is like okay <laughs> um, and I've had that happen a couple other times with whether it was a professor or a coach um, and, and just learning to listen um, that this is also a way that God speaks and that God is speaking in and through those people uh, to help me hear something about uh, myself that I may be doubting or not sure about uh, so I've certainly been grateful for mentors and coaches and teachers who've um, been able to uh, meet me where I am, you know, because there is, I mean, something you'll see in the text, I mean, Jesus could have dismissed Thomas and been like, dude, if you can't get with it, like, I don't know why I selected you in the first, like, you know, but the links that Jesus goes to find Thomas and to help Thomas believe is to me one of the most grace-filled parts of the story. Uh, I mean, the, the disciples are giving Thomas a hard time, but Jesus is so like filled with grace that he comes back another time to try to find Thomas and say, Thomas, hey. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that reassurance is so beautiful. I think as you were talking about that experience, I think back to my experience of discerning a call to ministry and really starting that process um, where for a long time I kind of had that sneaking suspicion that God might be calling me to ministry, but again had that voice in my head of this is something your dad does this is how you grew up this is what you're comfortable doing so obviously this can't be for you because it's just where you're comfortable um and you know anything that you think you're gifted at or that you're talented at is just because of how you grew up it's not because of any calling or anything on your life um and then as i worked with youth in Louisville and then continue to work with youth here, I'm reminded that like, no, this is actually um, where I experience God, where I find joy. Um, and the other night I was feeling really down just about a lot of things in general. And when Kyle and I left Louisville, they gave us this jar where all of the youth wrote a little note to us. Um, and it was a bunch of youth that did it, a bunch of former youth, a bunch of youth leaders that had had Kyle and me as youth when we were in high school and then had um, kind of seen us grow up and were at our wedding. And um, so I hadn't opened that jar since we moved to North Carolina four years ago. And I got it and was reading through all the notes. And it was a really good reminder um, just looking back and seeing, like, no, you actually did influence people. Um, all of the work that I did wasn't just because it was something that I wanted, but it was something that God was using to, to shape and form and help others grow. One question I find myself asking myself a lot, especially during times like these, is where do I see God? When I'm trapped at home with my family, all five of us humans, three cats and two dogs, where can I see God in the things that I see every single day? Of course, there's no concrete answer to this. But for me, I see God in little things. I see God in the way we all get outside and garden. I see God in the way my little brother likes to play chess every morning and watch a movie every night. I see God in the way my dog likes to chase butterflies. And I see God in the way the sun rises and the sun sets. And while these are so simple things, these are things that I never noticed before. In the summer, I go to a camp that I love dearly named Greystone. And at Greystone, there's always a morning where the oldest girls get to preach. And this past summer, this girl Emma and her friend Alexandra, they said something that really stuck out to me. Look for the godwinks. Well, what exactly is a godwink? A godwink is a small thing that you notice that is almost like God winking at you. And I think that all the little things that I listed before well, I think that they're God winks. Yes, I could play chess with my little brother every day and I could go garden every weekend. I could wake up early enough to see the sun rise and stay up to see the sun set. But during times like these, it's the fact that they bring such joy and fun and laughter into my home and my family and that make them God winks. So I think that where I see God right now is everywhere around me because I just keep looking for the God winks and keep praying because I know that God is here and I know that he's listening. And so that kind of leads to, that was really a God sighting for me um, in the, the last week or so 
But I guess that leads into the, a question of where do you see evidence of God in the world and or where do you need to see God in your life or in the world right now? It's been really interesting. I think, um, you know, we talk about God sightings, you know, we often are trying to look, you know, either inside the church community or at, I do this a lot with urban nature and all those things are great. Um, I have a really good friend of mine um, through my knit night group who is part of a disaster response team. And um, she is going to Tennessee tomorrow to work in Nashville as continued cleanup efforts after all the tornadoes, which just kind of got overshadowed by all the coronavirus mess. But um, just seeing how, how God uses everybody has been really incredible and that it sort of mixes in with some of that kind of, you know, doubt, struggle, sort of thing to see how, how God just uses anybody, um, in the world. And, um, it's not just those with perfect faith. It's not even those who have like the same faith. It's, it's, um, I mean, I, I believe the work she is doing is, is divinely inspired and divinely needed along with everybody else. Um, you know, it, it it's just, it's incredible to see the good, the good that is happening sort of in the midst of all the darkness, um, right now. I think I've been uh, reflecting on the just wildly creative nature of the work of the Spirit. Um, you know, in some of the Lenten texts, we talked about uh, the Spirit blows where it will and sort of does what it will do. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think sometimes we we contain that within the shell of the church or we contain that within sort of this is sort of the, the proper way. Um, and just sort of when now a lot of that's not available to us, the, the creative ways that the Spirit is moving uh, and that people are finding to express faith and appreciation and people are participating in shared sacrifice. Um, and you certainly you know, lament that all of this has happened um, and you wouldn't have wished it to have happened by any stretch of the imagination. And finding ourselves in the midst of this circumstance, uh, instead of people kind of... Uh, shrinking in there's been this actual like outpouring and extent and I just find myself almost daily inspired uh, some of them people of faith in the church and you're right others who I don't know about their faith story or background uh, but they they see a need and they step in um, you know whether it's meals provided to hospital workers or um, it's folks who are taking pay cuts to share that with other resources uh, I mean it just and the, even the creative expressions just in walks around the neighborhood where I see children have uh, colored driveways or um, they've still put out signs of sort of Easter and resurrection in their yard and proclaimed their faith uh, I, you know in, in creative ways that people are connecting with each other um, and staying in relationship with each other um, you know we've had uh, two two deaths in the life of the church during this season uh, and um, there would have been a sort of a normal response uh, to how we would have sort of come alongside those families and in some ways we haven't been able to do that but one of the things we did was we took those Easter flowers that you saw uh, in the sanctuary and broke those into small arrangements and delivered them to some of the homes. And I had the privilege of delivering flowers to Judy Crook. And so I, I sort of ran up, put them on her doorbell and backpedaled after I rang the doorbell and kind of backed up. And she came out on the porch and uh, six feet apart, we prayed prayers of, of resurrection. We prayed for Robert um, and her grandchildren were playing in the yard. And so sort of in the midst of death, there was life. Um, in the midst of struggle, there was signs of the next generation that, that moves forward. And, um, you know, it's like it's inviting all of us to be creative in the ways that we um, continue to follow the prompting of God's spirit in the world. One of the ways I see God most clearly is in relationships, both with my relationships with other people as well as other people's relationships with each other. And so that's one of the really beautiful things I've enjoyed seeing is how families are finding new and different ways to connect with each other when all being stuck at home. And while certainly that isn't the case for everyone, I've loved seeing um, online, I've seen this family who will do a themed dinner night, um, either once a week or every night one week. Um, and it reminds me, we did a Zoom call with Kyle's side of the family on Easter Sunday, which is something that we've never done before. And usually these are people that we only see about once a year, if that often. And it was really fun where we got all of the aunts and uncles on. One of Kyle's uncles didn't even realize he had Wi-Fi in his house until this experience. <laughs> and so that was a, a new and fun discovery for him. Um, 
and even when there were technical difficulties during the call, we just muted everybody, and Kyle's brother, who's really into tech stuff and does that for a living, called Uncle Jim and got him all set up, and um, yeah, it was just a really great experience of um, not only being able to connect with family in new and different ways, but also having the time, and everyone having the time, and making the time for each other, which is something that didn't, at least in our case, happen very often. Uh, before all of this happened, but is something that I've really enjoyed and hope will continue. Maybe just as a way of wrapping all this up, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, sometimes interesting when you look at a text, um, particularly if it's always sort of been read or often presented one way, to kind of read it through a, a different lens, and so um, you know, maybe instead of calling him Doubting Thomas and kind of reading it through the disciples' eyes who are, you know, for almost teasing or mocking him for, for missing out, um, what would it mean to read the text through Jesus' eyes um, and to see the links that Jesus goes uh, to find Thomas and to assure Thomas and to uh, allow him to see the evidence that he needs to see to be able to uh, believe? What's that concept out there? I mean, it's like FOMO, fear of missing out or something like that. I mean, I think the word of grace in this text is uh, that you don't have to have FOMO. Um, Jesus is not going to let you miss out. Um, Jesus is going to find you. Um, the resurrected Lord will find you, even if you're behind locked doors, which in some ways we are right now. Uh, by the power of the Spirit, the raised Christ will find you where you are um, and bring you life and life abundant. So rest in, in that peace and trust Pray for the church and the world. As I bid the petition, Lord, in your mercy, we will respond, hear our prayer. We pray for the people of the world, for the haves and the have-nots, for the knowers and the doubters, for the powerful and the powerless, that we could live in peace and learn to be kinder to one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. We pray for our bishops, pastors, and leaders. We pray for our congregations who cannot meet face to face, but be present with us when we are far apart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for communities where we live and for every community. Give us compassion to help each other. Show us glimpses of hope in the actions of our neighbors and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our friends and families. You know what we need before we can ask. Heal those who are sick, comfort those who grieve, give hope to the sad, and peace to the anxious. Help us find new ways to connect with one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for those who have won the race and are resting in eternal life. We see their witness on earth and pray that we can obtain their joy in heaven. Comfort us when we miss them and help us to in imitate their good works. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the doubters and the knowers, hear our prayers that we offer today through Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Even God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace.